Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Good morning. It's a sad morning. We're going to be saying goodbye to the Delta IV Medium. Now, there's still plenty of Delta IV Heavies that are going to be launched, uh, but this is the last time we're going to see a single stick Delta IV Medium fly ever. So, let's do the thing, and immediately we're just going to go right into the pre-launch preview here. Uh, again, you know, if you need to know anything about upcoming launches, just go to this nice little website called everydayastronaut.com and click on pre-launch previews. And right here you will find a little rundown. It even shows all the things like in your local time zone and everything. But let's go ahead and click on this one. This is the Delta IV uh, medium carrying GPS-3 SVO2. And this is, of course, scheduled to launch today, August 20, 22nd. Um, launch window begins at 1300 UTC. Um, nine, that's nine o'clock a.m. Eastern, but I think it actually got pushed uh, 30 seconds or one minute back. So <laughs> look out, little delay, but not much, obviously. Um, but this is the, the mission name is GPS-3 SVO2. Um, this is the second launch of a third generation GPS satellite. And obviously I think, I think most of us know, have a good idea of what a GPS satellite is. This is pretty exciting. Uh, third gen GPS is uh, extra exciting. Someday maybe we'll be to the point where like, you know, it's within like millimeters or something. Uh, this is, I don't remember the accuracy. It's getting pretty spooky though. Like it's, it's pretty amazing how accurate these new GPS satellites are. Um, the launch provider is ULA, United Launch Alliance, which of course is a joint venture between Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Uh, the customer is the US Air Force and also the Missile Systems Center. Um, then the rocket, of course, is the Delta IV medium, 4-2. So it's a four meter fairing and two solid rocket boosters. Oh, it's the last one, she grows up so quick. Um, this is taking off from Space Launch Complex 37 or Slick 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Um, Slick 37 means Space Launch Complex. And that, of course, is why we know it's at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Um, if it just said LC Launch Complex, that would be at NASA. And really, there's only one, uh, well, two active sites there, um, LC-39A and LC-39B for now. So, yeah. Um, let's keep going here. The, this is going out to medium Earth orbit. That's where GPS satellites are. They, they orbit the Earth twice a day. Um, the Delta IV is not recoverable in any way. Um, the first stage will crash into the ocean like all other expended rockets. Um, the fairing is not recoverable. And, and again, the first stage will go, will actually go really far downrange. The first stage will burn, has a really long burn time. Um, the fairing is not recoverable either on these rockets. This is the 29th and final flight of a Delta IV medium. Um, this is only the fourth launch for ULA this year. Um, 135th mission overall for United Launch Alliance since it's forming in 2006. And here we have the graphics from Jeff Barrett. Um, and it shows, you can tell that, you know, the Delta IV medium tapers up like this, um, has the smaller um, Delta cryogenic upper stage, um, or the smaller fairing, the four meter fairing. Um, yeah, so uh, it, uh, this is, this thing's, you know, it's not very heavy uh, as, in terms of going to medium Earth orbit, 3,800 kilograms, that's why I was able to fly on a medium stick like this. It only has two solid rocket boosters. Um, but these are, these are cool rockets because they use hydrogen for this. The, well, both stages are, are hydrogen, um, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. And the first stage is, I mean, hydrogen's so, um, I always forget the right word. Un, undense, disdense, no dense, lightweight, that uh, the tanks are just huge. They're massive. If this vehicle was RP-1, uh, it'd be significantly smaller but this runs on hydrogen, which is which is extreme can be extremely efficient. So um, that RS sixty eight A engine is kind of a derivative, uh, a cheaper version of the RS twenty five that that powered the space shuttle main engine. Um, it is open cycle; it's not closed cycle. It has things like uh, it has a because it's expendable. It actually has an ablative nozzle, meaning the the nozzle can literally just shed pieces of it all the way up, and you'll see that in its orange exhaust. So. Um, yeah, pretty crazy. Um, let's double check ULA's Twitter here and get any feeds. Um, they had a brief hold um, or a brief red for cloud cover today. 
So, um, 57 seconds ago, looks like, like, here we go. Okay, so, um, meteorologists are reporting that showers just east of the launch site, but weather is go currently. Okay. Okay, so, and then eight minutes ago, it looks like they had, the countdown has entered a plan for the 30-minute built-in hold at T-minus four minutes. So, ULA does things differently. For, for some reason, um, they kind of do these, like, built-in holds throughout different times in the countdown. So, you'll see, like, a, a intended hold but it's not actually like a hole. I don't know. It's really, it's hard to explain. Uh, let's go ahead and see if their live stream's up. It's not, so we'll, we'll do, we'll do little, little live stream uh, big me. How are you guys? Oh man, I am really hoping this, this something happens today with this, uh, mostly because I feel like I'll be streaming quite a bit because I just streamed on, was it Monday Rocket Lab launch or Sunday or something? I, I Time is irrelevant. Time does not exist at this point for me because I'm waiting. I'm down here. I'm actually on South Padre Island waiting for Starhopper to hop, uh, hoping that that happens relatively soon. For those of you wanting to know, it's definitely not happening this week, unfortunately. Today is Thursday. Um, it sounds like they're now targeting Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. I really hope so. I, I really hope so. I've been gone for over two or over a week now, well over a week. I don't know. Again, time doesn't exist, and uh, it's not only it only not only is it taxing like it's kind of like, you know hard to have to always get hotels and all that stuff. But the but uh, on a personal level, my dad went to the ER last night for heart problems, and that's not fun. And I'm uh, waiting to hear news. It's not heart problems. He doesn't actually know what it is. He's thinking it's I don't know. He I don't know. So I've kind of got that on my mind right now. So I'm I apologize if I'm a little bit uh, aloof. But I really hope that everything there is okay because obviously if something, uh, if, if I need to go home, I'm going home absolutely, like immediately, like I would do it in the middle of this live stream. So a um, little patience with me if something happens or anything. Uh, I'm going to be kind of paying attention to uh, communications with my family this morning. So um, everyone just uh, say a quick thought or prayer for my dad if whatever you're into. Uh, hope that everything turns out okay and everything's fine. So... Um, meanwhile, we'll watch some pretty colored bars uh, as we wait for this launch. Their coverage looks like it's going to be beginning in 2 minutes and 15 seconds. So, yeah, absolutely. Family first. Absolutely. Um, yeah, good. Um, Michael, after, thank you so much. How are you, Michael? Um, Matthew, thank you for everything you do. Sending my thoughts and prayers to you. Well, thank you, Matthew. That's really kind. Thank you. Um, unnecessary <laughs> thanks guys uh yeah uh, liquid chris hey man thank you uh i do too Devin, thank you very much um yeah so it it's it's hot down here in texas i spent uh, a good amount of time yesterday i went out to the out to, out to boca chica just in case like i knew there was no chance star hopper was gonna hop yesterday but i mean just in case i had to go out to the cape and and just hang out there or not the cape sorry boca chica and hang out there uh, in case something happened with Starhopper where they're like, you know what, we got a license right now. We're going to go ahead and launch this baby. That, you know, I think those of us that follow SpaceX know that that's kind of always in the back of their mind. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, so it ended up uh, really, it was like 100 degrees, of course. The sand was so hot. I, I went up on the dunes and got some video from different angles and pictures and stuff. And I, like, burnt my feet in the stupid hot sand. <laughs> and... Uh, the, I, but I, it was fun. I, I drove the Tesla around on the beach, which was half terrifying. I've just never, never thought I would be driving a Tesla on a beach. And it was kind of spooky, but it was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it cut it a little bit close trying to, I had to charge on a Chevy Volt charger at a Chevrolet station in Brownsville because there's no chargers in Brownsville. The closest charger is on South Padre Island and I cut it awfully close. I pulled in, um, to South Padre Island with like 1% or something. It was absolutely absurd. So, um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Captain and, and Michael. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and Robert. Uh, yeah, I'm sure everything will be fine. You know, he's, he's being looked after at the, at the hospital, so I'm sure everything's perfectly fine. Um, he went there like two months ago with similar symptoms, and he's had a heart replacement. And my dad's like the healthiest person ever. He, my parents bike 20, 30 miles a day, like relentlessly. They absolutely, they bike 
nonstop. They are health freaks. So it's so weird. It, my dad had a, a heart valve replacement. Sorry, not a heart replacement. A heart valve replacement um, about six or seven, six years ago now. Um, he had a bicuspid heart valve. And so uh, he had that replaced. And so I think they're, my, my family, my parents obviously take um, extreme precaution anytime there's anything that feels like it could be even closely related to any kind of heart thing. Because obviously a, a heart valve replacement, you want to make sure everything's good there. So I'm sure my dad's fine. Thank you, everyone, for, for your thoughts. Um, yeah, th thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Alex and, and Milo and uh, Nick, Nikolai. Uh, wh oh, what do I think of KSP2? I would love to talk about KSP2. That's my thoughts. My thoughts are just launch director. Vehicle is ready for launch. We'll turn this down for a second. Um, KSV2 looks absolutely incredible. I really hope it runs on a new, uh, some kind of new graphics. I don't know how that stuff works, but one of the things that I don't like about KSP1 is it relies on only a single processor, and it doesn't use your graphics card very well. So I hope KSP2 does better. At Here Space we go. Launch Complex 37, a Delta IV rocket is fueled and ready to launch, the second next-generation GPS-3 satellite for the United States Air Force Space and Missile System Center. Good morning and welcome to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. I'm Tyler Strickland, a trajectory engineer from ULA's mission design team. We are currently proceeding to, uh, towards liftoff at 9.01 a.m. Eastern. The launch team is not working any issues at this time. Yeah, that's good. You may have noticed the change in launch time. That's due to one momentary collision avoidance period during today's window. We are currently in a planned 30-minute hold. We have two planned holds in today's nine-and-a-half-hour launch countdown. These planned holds give our team additional time to resolve any issues that come up prior to entering the terminal count. Will Ulrich, the 45th Space Wing's weather officer, recently briefed the launch team on current weather conditions here at Cape Canaveral. Here are the numbers. The probability of violating launch constraints is 20%. The ground winds are 10 knots out of the southeast, and the temperature is 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So the weather is within the launch commit criteria, and it looks favorable for our plan T0 at 9.01 a.m. Eastern. Roger that. Proceed. Live coverage of today's mission will conclude following the main engine cutoff number one. However, let's take a look at the events we'll see today from liftoff through SV separation of GPS-3. Five, four, Three, two, one. Actually, I really like that they, they do these, uh, these reviews like this because they, they, so the cool thing about the Delta family and Atlas is they literally can program every single second. So they have a lot of flexibility um, in their launch windows and that requires the ability to build a dog leg. Um, yeah, it's pretty sweet. And by the way, notice you're going to see the rocket has um, well, you'll see it's main. Ex you'll see the main thing that you're seeing there is the solid rocket boosters have a really, really, really bright orange, really bright plume. Um, but the RS-68A engine, normally you wouldn't see the exhaust because it's running on hydrogen, and hydrogen and oxygen uh, burn clear, completely clear. Um, the only byproduct is water, actually, water vapor. And uh, but you actually will totally see this engine burning, even when it's when it doesn't have the solid rocket boosters attached because of that uh, ablative nozzle that it has. And that ablative nozzle makes it burn what looks like orange, but that's actually just parts of it literally chipping away, like intentionally chipping off, which just seems like how can, how can you have enough of it to, to not just burn through, you know, and have that, have that work out and have it like continually burn out. It, it seems crazy that it works at all like that. So, um, yeah, hold on, no Tam. Twenty first. No, it's not today. Hmm. Okay. Listen, listen to this. Is protected inside a four meter diameter payload fairing. At approximately four minutes twenty six seconds, the payload fairing is jettisoned.
Roger. So 16 minutes, guys. Nice day out there in Florida. Look ULA is using the Delta IV Medium Plus 4-2 rocket for today's mission. This is the 40th Delta IV launch in ULA's 135th mission. Built in Decatur, Alabama, the Delta IV Medium Plus 4-2 includes a common booster core powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-68A engine and two Northrop Grumman solid rocket motors. An Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10B2 engine powers the Delta Cryogenic second stage and a four meter diameter payload fairing protects the satellite during ascent. Events leading to launch began June 26th when the GPS-3 spacecraft, otherwise known as Magellan, was encapsulated inside its payload fairing. On July 31st, the encapsulated payload fairing was transported to the Mobile Service Tower, or MST, at Space Launch Complex 37 and made it to the Delta IV rocket. Approximately eight hours ago, final preparations began at Space Launch Complex 37. Using 40 hydraulic cylinders at pressures nearing 3,500 PSI, the 10 million pound MST was raised eight inches and rolled back, revealing the Delta IV launch vehicle. Using a carriage transporter system traveling at about a quarter mile an hour, it takes about 25 minutes to roll the MST to its launch position 345 feet north of the Delta IV rocket. The Delta IV rocket stands 207 feet tall, or about 20 stories. The RS-68A main engine and two solid rocket motors combined to produce more than 1.2 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. About four minutes later, at stage separation, it weighs just 10% of what it did at liftoff. Sweet. This is Delta Mission Control at T-minus four minutes in holding. Today's flight will bring the second uh, satellite of the GPS-3 constellation to orbit. This satellite is referred to as Magellan. It is estimated that more than 4 billion military, commercial, and civil users worldwide connect with the Global Positioning System, or GPS. As essential as GPS is, the Air Force has committed to modernizing the entire system with new technology to make way for advanced capabilities and to build in flexibility to address future mission needs. Developed and built by Lockheed Martin for the Air Force, the more powerful GPS-3 satellites provide three times better accuracy, eight times improved anti-jamming capabilities, and a new L1C civil signal to improve worldwide connectivity for civilian users. Later in the broadcast, we're, we'll learn more about the GPS-3 Magellan mission when I'm joined by Major Jenny G from the Air Force's Space and Missile Systems Center. I recently had an opportunity to speak with ULA trajectory engineer Zach Henning, so we'll take a look at that count conversation. And we'll wrap up with a tribute to the Delta IV medium rocket. This morning's flight is the last for this configuration. In addition to watching our webcast, you can follow live mission progress at ULALaunch.com. I'm excited for that tribute. Raise your hand if you're excited for a Delta IV medium tribute. I have seen and, and sh photographed and shot one Delta IV medium in this LC net one. exact configuration. LLC. I step 1230, initiate retract data logger just prior to the L7 pole. Roger. Hold on, I'm going to listen in here and see what they're talking about. The GPS Directorate, based at the Air Force Space and Missile Systems Center, provided the artwork we see on the rocket's payload fairing. Let's take a look behind the art. The green banner contains the Directorate's motto, while the globe depicts the Earth as viewed from space and as the origin and control point for the GPS constellation. The grid lines emphasize the global accuracy of the GPS signal, and the six pulsars symbolize the six planes of the constellation and atomic clocks providing the never-ending heartbeat of precise timing. The three orbital planes represent the three generations of GPS satellites, and the heritage compass rose symbolizes early wisdom and navigation. Finally, the three stars in the black field represent the three GPS segments, space, ground, and user equipment. I still think that rocket looks really cool. One, an interesting fact here, guys. Today's flight is dedicated in memory of Bill Kisenberth and Tim Davis. 
Bill Kisenberg's career began in 1958 when he joined the hydraulics design department at Douglas Aircraft's Missiles and Space Division. Bill was assigned to the Nike Zeus Anti-Ballistic Missile Program. In 1970, Bill joined the Delta team as manager of mechanical systems and spent the rest of his more than 57-year career working on the Delta program, much of it leading the mechanical ground support equipment design team. Bill's accomplishments included serving as the project manager for the Delta II and Delta III facility modifications and as the lead engineer for MGSE design in support of the successful launch of NASA's EFT-1 Orion mission in 2014. Bill was an active member of his community, assuming leadership roles in his neighborhood, church, and high school sports. He was devoted to his wife of 59 years and their four children and grandchildren. Bill was loyal, organized, and took pride in accomplishing meaningful things. He is sincerely missed by all who had the pleasure of working with him. This morning's flight is also dedicated in memory of Tim Davis. Tim Davis joined Quality Assurance Team in 1999 at Boeing, now ULA's, Decatur, Alabama production facility. He began in the Precision Measurement Group and later became a quality engineer for the Major Structures Group. Tim was well respected by his peers for his technical ability and well liked for his personality. Tim was devoted to his wife of 19 years and their children. He loved working on his farm, taking care of their horses, being involved in his church and his children's sports activities. He was a quiet and loving husband and father and was a pleasure to be around. He is sorely missed by both his family and colleagues. I think it's so cool that they dedicate the rockets to their workers. RC. Verify solar radiation limits acceptable for launch. Verified. Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint, any time after the terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel one, identify their station, and briefly state the reason for the hold. Flight control, LC. Flight control. Perform launch on time verification. Roger. It's beautiful. L minus nine minutes. OSM, verify the hold fire switches in the proceed position. Ready to proceed. RLM, verify red line monitor and event table are in the correct configuration for terminal count. Verified. Everything's looking good so far. Don't forget, guys, they won't even have the time clock running until about the time clock, <laughs> until about five more minutes, and then we'll see that T-minus clock start moving. This is normal. So don't, don't be too worried. Um, one thing that I, uh, that's really interesting to me about this rocket is it controls its roll, uh, especially on the single stick, using the... Oh, minus eight minutes. The gas generator exhausts. So there's two gas generators on this vehicle, and it uses the exhaust of that to actually control roll. Because um, it's hard when you have a single engine to be able to roll a, a vehicle. Obviously, this kind of has two extra engines attached. This is Delta Mission Control at T-minus four minutes in holding. We remain in the planned 30-minute built-in hold as preparations for launch continue. In a few moments, launch conductor Dylan Rice will pull the launch team for the final go to pick up the countdown. 27 engineers and managers are pulled for system status and readiness to proceed. This is the final status check before launch for all Delta vehicle systems, ground systems, the spacecraft, and the U.S. Air Force Eastern Range. The vehicle system readiness poll includes electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Let's listen in as Dylan Rice performs the final polling of the launch team. I have to say, I do like this part. I think this is pretty fun. Roger. feels this feels like this is so a, tr a traditional thing here you know with the actual polling and I like that they show the the polls so we get to see everything that they check off so this is actually them in launch control polling everyone at their stations to make sure that they're go for launch and they're going to be checking it off here as we go through and obviously they have the first stage systems second stage systems all that stuff um, that should be happening pretty soon here because then once go that two. polls go second stage LH2 30 minute conditioning is complete They'll release Roger. it from that four minute hold. We will be extending this built in hold an additional five minutes to complete second stage propellant conditioning. Okay, so they just pushed it back five more minutes. Fuel <laughs> they, too, LC. Go. 
Step 1060, perform second stage LH2 fill and drain valve cycle test. Roger. They only they have a 27 minute long window today, I think, 27-ish minutes. So um, it can't get pushed back too much more. They do have a launch window for Don't this. Don't minus six minutes. Mm, not all minus six minutes if it just got pushed back five minutes. That's confusing. Hmm. So what we'll likely see then is we won't see that clock move for um, five minutes from there. We won't see that clock move still for another about five minutes. But uh, they are just continuing to top off the vehicle. You can see it venting a little bit of uh, gaseous liquid oxygen uh, as it as it outgasses. Uh, or LC, LD on one. Not outgasses, so that's LD. the word. Please coordinate a new T0 of 13 colon 06 colon zero zero Zulu. All right, so that is nine, Roger, and, a, one, three, nine zero, and a half six, minutes from zero, now. Zero, Zulu. RC, LC, net one. Go ahead. Please coordinate a new T0 of 13 colon zero 06 colon zero zero Zulu. So, so, sorry, as it boils off, as liquid oxygen boils off, you hey, see it LC, one. venting there. Please set the clock for a new T0 of one. Three zero six zero zero Zulu. In work. Okay, so yeah, nine ish minutes. Hopefully, we'll hear the polling here soon. Um, they pull with right the extension of the hold. We now have a new T zero planned for nine oh six a.m. Eastern. Roger. And something uh, to me. Look at this shot here, real quick. Notice, uh, poop. And same with this one even. Uh, notice that the shadow of the vehicle is kind of like well illuminated because of the bounce light off that big white fairing. It, this looks like a render to me because it's so such perfect lighting conditions. We have that nice low sun from it being uh, morning. It's just, look at that, it's just beautiful. Soft. This is gonna be a pretty launch. We're gonna see some really pretty pictures today from, from our friends Go that are shooting. Uh, range has approved new T0. Roger. I know John Krause set up like eight cameras or something today to say goodbye to the Delta IV medium, so I'm sure uh, he's going to have at least one spectacular photograph. I just know it. He, one of his uh, the most epic pictures that ULA printed out actually on the inside of their, their building, I believe was a Delta IV medium. Uh, they printed it out like on this entire wall, and it's this beautiful picture of and the, the SRBs one, the LC, and the RS-68. Uh, of the, the valve cycles, we are ready to proceed into our terminal count status check. We, oh yeah, uh, one poll that they don't do on camera, but what I can do here, I can definitely verify the pointy end is up, the flamey end oh, is down. Eight minutes. <laughs> Don't you guys worry. That has officially happened, and it looks like we're going to go. I mean, this this rocket's really LG easy. To ready position. All steps complete prior to the status check. This rocket's really easy to to determine the uh, pointy end up, flaming end down bit. All right, so it sounds like they're they're good to go. Hopefully, we'll start hearing the the poll, the go no go, the go no go poll here soon. Um, yeah, and again, I, I just really quickly need to keep saying, um, uh, so thank you, Nikolai, uh, uh, again, super stoked for KSP2. Uh, Jake, thank you so much. Alex, hope it goes well. I do too. Thank you, PCR1. Subscribe to follow your vlogs. Never forget how to donate. Well, thank you, PCR. Uh, TC, my, all the best for your dad. We'll have a beer for him. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I like this one, Mars Mountain. Get well, Tim Dad. <laughs> uh, me, myself. I love your channel. You're smart. I'm not smart. I'm just always asking questions. Never stop asking questions. Uh, Status check to proceed with terminal count, first aid systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. This is good. Go. <laughs> locks. Go. LH2. Yes. Go. Second stage systems, locks. Go. LH2. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFSTS. Go. Flight control. Go. Calm. Go. TCQ. Go. Operation support. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Hazgas. Go. ECS. 
Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Oh, minus six minutes. Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. This is the mission director. You have permission to launch. Yes. Proceeding with the count. MEQ established. Swing arm lock pins pulled. Roger. Yes. Okay, guys. Pulling so. Pulling is complete, and the launch team has given the go for launch. The countdown will resume approximately two minutes from now. At T minus four minutes and counting, we enter the terminal count and begin securing the second stage liquid oxygen tank. At T minus three minutes and 32 seconds, booster liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tank securing is started, which includes closing the propellant fill and drain valves. Also at T minus three minutes and 32 seconds, vehicle transfer from ground facility power to its own internal battery power will be complete. At T minus three minutes, the vehicle ordnance system will be armed and booster liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen propellant tanks are verified to be at flight pressure and flight level. At two minutes prior to liftoff, the team will verify that the hydraulic system is pressurized as well as confirm booster, DCSS, and flight termination system battery voltages. At T minus one minute and 20 seconds, the team will begin securing the second stage liquid hydrogen tank. At T minus 60 seconds, the eastern range readiness is verified. At T minus 50 seconds, the DCSS liquid hydrogen tank is secured at flight level. A final launch vehicle and spacecraft status check is conducted at T minus 30 seconds. At T minus 15 seconds, the ROFIs, or sparklers, are ignited to burn off excess hydrogen at the base of the vehicle. Liftoff will occur at T zero. After liftoff, We'll hear the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicle ascent data. Okay. All right, guys. So we. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. We anticipate releasing the hold in just a few moments. Yep. So again, they intentionally do a hold, a built-in hold, and then they will release T it. T minus four minutes and counting. Yes. There we go. Nice. Three fifty-five. The countdown clock has resumed. We've entered the terminal count, and we are go for launch at 9.06 a.m. Eastern. Okay. Everything's looking good, guys. T minus 3 minutes and 40 seconds. It's, it's pretty cool that it's going to be a uh, GPS satellite. I like that. People want me to double check my quality. <laughs> Second stage lock, secure at flight level. Sorry about that. Three oh seven. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Good old hotel Wi-Fi not telling me what's up. Um, <laughs> uh, Soldier of the Ark, 825 Fahrenheit FTS global warming. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know where 825 Fahrenheit came from. Um, but hi, and CPC thank you. locks at flight pressure and flight level. Where were you, Discord? I asked you guys if quality was okay. <laughs> it's all your fault, Discord. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> um, people are asking where I am. I'm on South Padre Island waiting for Starhopper to fly again for its last time. CBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. Um, heavy Cream, good morning. I hope this Texas trip hasn't been too hard for you. Do I think Starship could serve as a rent-a-station once the ISS is no more? Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. Two minutes, 159. Heavy Cream, I think... Starship. 155. Launch sequencer start. Hydraulic pressure. At 4,000. Alright, everything's looking 140. good. 140. FCS launch enabled. 137. Um, heavy T cream. T-minus 90 seconds. The launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and eastern range are go for launch. Yes. Uh, heavy cream, we'll talk about that more in a second. I'll, I'll 120. talk about that quite a bit. OCU's arm. FCS count started. Okay. 
T minus one, one minute. minute. Engine start box, go. Rock, report range status. Range green. 50. All right. <laughs> range is green, so that of course means there's no uh, airplanes or boats Second within the trajectory. Level. 30 seconds. Status check. Go Delta. Go GPS. Okay. 23. SRM, CBC, blowdown. Everything's looking good. 15. Rough ignition. So those are the sparklers at the bottom to make sure T there's no... T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. We have ignition and liftoff, liftoff yes. of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the GPS-3 Magellan mission for the United States Air Force Space and Missile Systems Center. Yes. Body rate response looks good. Wow, is it pitch yeah, over right away? seconds in the flight. You were hearing the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicle ascent Chamber pressure data. looks good, seeing good chamber pressure across both SRMs. 25 seconds into flight. Continuing to see good operating parameters on the R68A main engine. Chamber pressure on both SRMs continues to look good, seeing good body rates on the vehicle. Dang, this now 40 looks seconds into flight. Looks like it's going so fast, those solids. Vehicle is now passing Mach 1, Delta 4 is now supersonic. Jeez. Now 50 seconds in. Main engine continuing to perform well, continuing to see a good burn profile on both SRMs. And vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Yeah, it does pitch Main over engine so continuing to perform well, continuing to see good SRM chamber pressure profiles. And they One SRM. minute, 15 seconds into flight. Our solid rocket motors. They don't Approximately say. 15 seconds remaining till SRM burnout. So they don't say solid rocket boosters. SRM chamber pressure is tailing off. And we have burnout on both SRMs. Standing by for separation. Bye-bye. Hopefully. <laughs> there they go. And we have separation of both solid rocket motors. Vehicle is now going to closed loop guidance. Body rate response looks good. Seeing minor correction in the roll attitude as expected. And the Delta IV rocket now weighs just one half of its liftoff weight. Second stage ACS system pressurization valve has been opened. RCS uh, pressure response looks good. Now two minutes, five seconds into flight. And vehicle is now passing through Mach 5. Delta 4 is now 36 miles in altitude, 55 miles downrange distance, traveling at 4,760 miles per hour. Looks like their data is not Two actually Two minutes, up. 30 seconds into flight. Chamber pressure on the R68 a main engine continues to look good. Body rate responses also continue to look good. Two minutes, 45 seconds into flight. Isn't it crazy how long the center core And upper stage lock system has begun the boost phase chill down sequence to begin thermal conditioning of the upper stage engine. Or how long the center core burns for, or the now main core. Now less than one minute remaining in the first stage phase of flight. And upper stage fuel system has begun boost phase chill down. Now three minutes, 15 seconds into flight. Delta four is now 65 miles in altitude, 148 miles downrange distance, traveling at 8,500 miles per hour. Wow. Now passing three minutes, 30 seconds into flight. Main engine continues to perform well. Chamber pressure looks good. Body rate responses on the Delta four also look good. That's not very high. About They've 10 pitched. seconds remaining until booster throttle down. And booster's now throttling down to the minimum power level in preparation for BECO. Standing by for BECO. And we have BECO booster engine cutoff. 
standing by for stage separation. We have good indication of stage separation. The upper stage engine nozzle extension is deploying. That nozzle extension, I got to tell you. We have restart on the RL-10. Standing by for ignition. We have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10 engine. Chamber pressure looks good. Body rates look good. Standing by for payload fairing jet. And we have payload fairing jettison. Sweet. Mission control at T plus four and a half minutes. We've just heard Patrick Moore report the successful execution of the early events of today's flight, and all systems continue to operate nominally. The Delta IV second stage and GPS-3 satellite are traveling in a northeasterly direction up the U.S. eastern seaboard. This mission is now in the first of two planned RL-10 engine burns. This burn will last approximately nine minutes. Jeez. Joining me now is GPS-3 Launch Integration and Operations Chief, Major Jenny G. Welcome. Thanks, Tyler. I'm excited to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about the GPS-3 mission? Sure. So GPS-3 is the newest generation of satellites that is required to maintain the GPS constellation, and it's going to provide improved positioning, navigation, and timing services to meet user demands now and in the future. Just to name a few new capabilities, um, we have the new L1C, Global Navigation Satellite System Interoperability Signal. We have higher signal power, greater accuracy, and longer spacecraft lifetime, as well as more signal availability. And there will be even more to come once the new ground control system becomes operational. And this will help GPS-3 um, maintain its status as the gold standard for worldwide satellite navigation. And uh, you had mentioned before that we were the GPS um, SPO, the direct directorate, but at the center we're currently shifting to a new paradigm called SMC 2.0. And GPS-3 is going to be an integral program as we move into the new production core and that will help lay the groundwork for how we provide improved support to our warfighter through our space capabilities and how we're going to improve leveraging our partnerships, um, find new ways to cultivate innovation and decision speed. So you talked a lot about uh, where you're going, but I'm curious about some of the older GPS satellites. What's the oldest one that's actively working on orbit? So our oldest working satellite um, is SVN-34, and that is a GPS-2A that was launched back in October 1993 by a ULA Delta II wow. launch vehicle. Yeah. Um, so for comparison, GPS-3 SVs have a 15-year design life. This is already 25% longer than the last generation of GPS-2F satellites. Those came with a 12-year design life. So SVN-34, it was manufactured by Rockwell, and it was the 14 of 19 Block 2A GPS satellites that were launched. It had a 7.5 uh, year design life, and so far it's been 24 years and it's still ticking. That's wow. crazy. I mean, speaking of the manufacturing, so where's the GPS-3 satellites, where are they being produced? So to ensure the most efficient GPS-3 production process, GPS-3, they're assembled at Lockheed Martin's multi-capability GPS processing facility in Waterton, Colorado. This is the assembly, integration, and test location for the entire GPS-3 fleet. Um, that facility was officially opened in February of 2012. It was built in the company's former rocket assembly building. Um, that facility has nearly 50,000 square feet of spacecraft assembly and test area, and it includes a clean room high bay, a dedicated thermal vacuum, and anechoic test chambers. Um, that high bay was designed to maximize efficiency by minimizing the number of space vehicle lifts and uh, minimizes the distances between operations. So just like aircraft and autom automobile production lines, each GPS-3 satellite will move through a sequential uh, series of workstations for various assembly and integration operations. And it will all culminate with environmental test procedures. Okay, so how exactly, you know, how dependent is the world on the GPS constellation? So there was actually an article published recently on uh, June 14th on Ars Technica summarizing a study that was sponsored by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and that estimated that a complete loss of GPS subfunction would cost the world over a billion dollars a day over a simulated 30-day outage period. They approximate Whoa. that from 1984 when GPS was first made uh, available for commercial use that GPS has generated $1.4 trillion in economic benefits. So GPS has improved bandwidth and reliability for wireless networks in the telecommunications industry. It made 4G LTE implementation possible with access to highly precise timing. And it has increased efficiency for vehicle dispatch and navigation, which is especially important for large-scale <coughs> agriculture. And it has made location-based services and apps available for smartphone users. 
So furthermore, there are new sectors of the economy, such as autonomous transport and Internet of Things, and they continue to find innovative and lucrative ways to take advantage of the precision, um, position navigation and timing made available by GPS free to the world. Well, well, I can definitely say that it's important to all of us. Thank you so much for spending some time explaining it to us, Major G. It was my pleasure, Tyler. Thank you. Continuing. This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 10 and a half minutes. All systems continue to operate nominally. The rocket's trajectory continues on a northeasterly heading. I recently caught up with fellow trajectory engineer Zach Henney. Let's take a look. So Zach, as a fellow trajectory engineer, I've heard a lot about GPS, but I know there's a lot more to it that I haven't heard about. So can you kind of explain to the audience today what is interesting about today's flight? Uh, first little interesting tidbit is we're going up the pretty much the entire east coast of the United States. Okay. Should be visible through most of the southeast, but we will be hugging the coast all the way up through the northeast, on through the Canadian coastline, and then off and over Europe and we'll be swooping back down around. We'll be doing our second burn south of Australia and we're coming into uh, line of sight of an Air Force receiving station on Hawaii that'll be driving our spacecraft separation time. 25 minutes after we come into view there we'll be separating the spacecraft. We're doing our third burn actually right above Denver. Um, mm. Fortunately nobody back there can see it because it's during the daytime. And then come back in for a re-entry in the ocean south of uh, South Africa. So this mission has a relatively short window compared to other launches, um, but you guys had a clever way of getting more out of that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so it's only 26 and a half to 27 minutes that we have to work with. So we're launching every 30 seconds, so at the top and the bottom of the minute to take full advantage of that. And that's really driven by the GPS constellation itself where we have six orbital planes that the constellation is in and we had to deliver the spacecraft into one of those planes to the target that was given to us by our customer and to make things work and give us the best opportunity to get it on orbit we decided to go every 30 seconds and work it like that. Awesome so essentially that just doubles the amount of opportunities we would normally have with because of that short window. Yep exactly and makes for quirky things like 9 a.m. and 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I also know that this is your first mission. You know, you've been at ULA for a few years, but you've been working on this mission for a while. Could you kind of walk us through what all of you worked on and, and how you're feeling about the launch today? Yeah, so I picked it up two years ago this month in August of 2017, where we started with the preliminary mission analysis, which really gave us a good first look at the mission and what we were going to expect going into our more detailed analyses as we moved along and from there with every trajectory iteration just refined it more and more and eventually it got closer to what we're flying and things started to get real <laughs> <laughs> and then coming out here this week uh, it was exciting being able to drive up here to the Delta Operations Center for the first time and just seeing the pad lit up in the dark sky behind it and really sank in that we're launching this bird. Awesome. So Zach, what's your role on launch day and where will you be? So on launch day, I'm in the engineering support area here at the Delta Operations Center. I'm on console for flight mechanics and I'm monitoring the state of the rocket through the various phases of the flight and making sure that everything looks good. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for taking some time to talk with me. I know you're really busy this week, so really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I'm not sure they probably don't have too much longer in this. This is Delta time. Mission Control at T plus 13 minutes and counting. The Delta IV rocket carrying the GPS 3 Magellan satellite lifted off from Space Launch Complex 37 at 9.06 a.m. Eastern Time. We're now approaching the first main engine cutoff. Let's join Patrick Moore for mission progress. About 20 seconds. RL 10 engine operating parameters continue to look good. And about 10 seconds remaining until Miko. Standing by for cutoff. And we have Miko, main engine cutoff. Body rate responses damping out nicely from the shutdown transient. We've got their telemetry up we there. We just too. heard Patrick Moore report Miko 1. The mission now enters a long coast phase. We'll conclude our live coverage in a few minutes, but stay up to date with the rest of today's flight by following our blog. Before we sign off, We'd like to take a few minutes to remember the work done in service to our nation and the world 
by our Delta IV medium family of rockets. Though the Delta IV Heavy will continue to launch our nation's largest payloads, today marks the final flight of the Delta IV single-state configuration. Here's a look at its legacy. So I just wanted to point out, too quick, uh, that this basically Delta IV and Atlas V are going to be replaced by the Vulcan rocket. And the Vulcan rocket is still on, on track to be flying in 2021. Um, but there's a lot of convergence here between Atlas and Delta. So um, Vulcan's going to be doing all of that from now on for ULA. And then they will still have the Delta IV Heavy for the heaviest stuff. And Delta IV Heavy is extremely capable, especially um, for like long distance stuff. Uh, it just has a lot of upper stage payload cap. Uh, because of that cryogenic upper stage, it seems like it can just kick out a lot of payload up to geostationary orbit. Um, but yeah, look, I love all these shots of, of this stuff. I hope that they release all of this footage on its own on YouTube because I will definitely be pulling footage from this. They're really nice shots. Um, I forgot to mention too that uh, at Ignition, don't forget, <laughs> you, you might see it in these, these collages, um, it looks like the rocket lights itself on fire and that's because it literally does. It has, there's a little bit of hydrogen excess on the outside. Hydrogen is really, really hard to contain. It's so, again, undense or lightweight or um, however you want to say it, that it sneaks out through everything. So they intentionally will not only, like that, just see how it's literally on fire uh, and it's like taking off half black now. Uh, they do that at, at ignition. There's a whole bunch of hydrogen that still ends up being unburnt that they will intentionally light off. So um, that's pretty crazy. The other thing that's nuts about this, about the Delta IV, uh, is it does have an extending nozzle on the RL-10B. Okay, I'm going to listen in real quick and make sure there's nothing else they're going to say on sign out. But the, the, the RL-10, you need to look at how long that nozzle is. Uh, with the extended nozzle, it's huge. I'd like to thank Major Jenny G and Patrick Moore for their contributions to today's program. For more information about the mission, visit our websites at our, also our Facebook and Twitter pages, or as I mentioned earlier, our launch blog at ULALaunch.com. We'll leave you now with another look at liftoff of the Delta IV rocket carrying the Air Force's second GPS-3 satellite. I'm Tyler Strickland. On behalf of the entire launch team, thank you for joining us, and have a great day. Yay. Good job, Nine, Tyler. Eight, seven, okay, so we'll, we'll let this run again. Get ready. You'll see it uh, totally light itself on fire, which I think is just crazy. There it is. And then solid rocket ignition. Okay, so we've got some questions to answer. Oh, I do want to soak this in. Watch how quickly it pitches over. It pitches over like immediately, right there. Oop. That's crazy. <laughs> That's super cool. All right, well, they're signing off here, so we're just going to go. Hold on. Sweet. Good work, ULA. Congrats on a clean launch. Um, did want to mention, guys, if you work for ULA or you work for SpaceX or NASA or whatever, don't forget you can take 25% off any of my apparel um, in my web store. Uh, everything's selling out really quickly, but I did want to mention we do have a RUDS section. So if you guys want it, it, the cheapest that my merchandise has ever been, um, we do have new rapid unscheduled discounts section uh, to clear up some in old inventory as we get ready for some new shirts some new merch. Um, again, I do prints, I do actual runs. This is physical inventory. These are not um, like print on demand shirts anymore. So that means they're higher quality. Um, it also means I can get them down in price for you guys uh, on discounts like this. And uh, so yeah, we have only like two more Falcon family tees, I think. So if you happen to be a small <laughs> size and you want a white Falcon family tee, I think there's one or two more left there for you. Um, otherwise, these are close to selling out here. Um, so if you want the cheapest you'll ever see um, a t-shirt, go on to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Or, uh, of course, there's a few more that um, the, the full flow stage combustion cycle shirts are sold out again, uh, or getting darn close to sold out. There's only a few sizes left. Um, uh, so if you want stuff, guys, make sure and, and get it now because it sells out pretty quickly sometimes, even though we do runs. Um, just, yeah, if you see something and you want it, you, you should get it now before it sells out. Um, but we're working on restocking the utility pouches, 
um, oh, I didn't realize those sold out. I'll need to uh, do those. And we're also working on finally getting the, the Nauta coasters back in stock. So, um, yeah. So, whew, yeah, that was a cool launch. That was a good job, ULA. Oh, let me go back to this. Uh, we've got a few more questions to answer, and then I got to go because I need to uh, – what is going on? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, I've got to go because I have a podcast to record. So that's another thing. Don't forget, if you – uh, want more of me talking about space stuff, don't forget that I do have a podca- podcast that I do every single week uh, with two other YouTubers. It's called Our Ludicrous Future. We tend to talk about futurism and stuff. I, of course, talk about space flight. Uh, they talk more. Uh, ben Solens from Teslanomics talks about Tesla. And Joe Scott talks about whatever he wants from Answers with Joe. Uh, we have a lot of fun. So if you listen to podcasts or if you just want longer form content or if you just want your like weekly space updates, things about rockets, blah, 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 Um, our ludicrous future. Uh, I got to get ready for that. That's going to be happening here um, pretty soon for me. So, uh, but I've got a few more of your guys' questions to answer. Um, uh, Let's see. Hang on. In our Discord, last thing I'll say before I answer questions again, uh, if you want to join our Discord channel, that's a Patreon exclusive thing. So thank you to my Patreon members. Um, If you want to join our awesome Discord channel, patreon.com slash everyday astronaut um you guys are the reason that i'm able to sit here on south padre island waiting for star hopper to happen so uh thank you so much to my patreon supporters um and um so T- tim Berlin in our discord asks can you confirm the rumor that spacex launch count going down means they are over serving a small market um so oh, they're talking about the fact that the number of launches next year will go down from this year. Um, it is the, there was kind of a, a boom. We had a really busy year. I think last year was the busiest launch year in a long, long, long time. So, I mean, for now, it, it's just, there's not a ton of geostationary satellites being launched these days. There's a lot of like smaller low earth orbit constellations happening. Um, I think SpaceX will end up launching a ton next year because of Starlink. Once Starlink's really, really, really going out there, it will be nuts. So, uh, yeah, I I don't know if, I mean, maybe the industry as a whole has kind of changed a little bit. But, um, okay, so let's see. Oh, soldiers are, okay, so yeah, I got to the 825 global warming. So apparently they had the wrong uh, temperature up on screen. That's funny. Um uh, okay, so yeah, Heavy Cream, you asked about if Starship could serve as a rent station. I don't think, I mean, you realize once, once a vehicle like Starship is flying, once it's fully flying, fully reusable, um, it's, it will be game changing. And you can put up huge, like, they'll be able to put up a full space station in, in you know, a launch or two. This will open up a totally new economy. Uh, at a price that might be easily in order of magnitude lower than what is possible today. And that's the whole point. So I don't know if they need Starship itself to be a like space station replacement. They could just launch new space stations. This could be like, it'd be no big deal to go up uh, and launch like big, big, big modules that are not volume constrained like they are today and not nearly as much mass constraint because 100 tons to low Earth orbit is awfully generous and with a huge payload uh, fairing, large volume. Yeah, you can put up some pretty big pieces of hardware, relatively inexpensive, so um, pretty sweet in my opinion. Um, yeah. All right, um, and then let's see, Arvid, I need someone to verify that the pointy end up, we did that, we did the, the verification of the pointy end up flaming end down. Um, let's see here. Uh, Patricia, what if what if you were blind? How would you know what end is up or down? Um, I think I'm working on training seeing eye dogs for pointy end up, flaming end down that that can let um, seeing impaired individuals be able to still have their own local determination of pointy end up, flaming end down. And also, that's what the t-shirts are for, you know, with the sleeves, so you can I don't know. Um, <laughs> Patrick, thanks for becoming a new member. Uh, Arvid uh, was, yeah, the, the graphic from the Delta was talking about weather. It was supposed to say 85 degrees Fahrenheit, and apparently they had 825 degrees Fahrenheit. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, Dodge Rider, ready for boost back burn. Uh, expendable rocket, obviously didn't have a boost back burn. Uh, that's funny. Uh, thanks, Dodge Rider. And um, 
Caver Eric, what do I think about the Gateway Foundation? I need to listen. Um, the Gateway Foundation was on tomorrow, I think like last year. That's T M R O on YouTube. Like the yeah, it's, you spell it T M R O. Definitely look that up. It was a really good interview with Gateway Foundation. Um, I think it's really cool. I need to rewatch it again because I was actually thinking about doing a video talking kind of more about that. I don't really do like. I talk so much about hardware, and and I'm talking a lot about hardware uh, in this next video, guys. I am. If you thought I went deep uh, on the full flow stage combustion cycle, uh, the Raptor engine video, I think this Aerospike video might actually be at at least as much. I've learned almost as much doing this video as I did when I learned the full about uh, when I did the Raptor video, and that Raptor video, as you probably know, is like 48 minutes long or something ridiculous. Um, I think this one's going to be right up there. I tend to do videos about hardware. I don't really do so many videos about like organizations and stuff because like, what is there to talk about really? Like, oh, you guys want to do this? Me too. Neat. Uh, but uh, Gateway Foundation is pretty cool. Uh, again, I probably need to look into them more because it's been, it's been a minute. Um, John Beatty, <laughs> let's see the stuff fly. Thank you, John. How are you? Um, and key, yeah, uh, and Flex DG KSP2 Hype Train, I cannot wait. Again, I, I was starting to say, I really hope it can use graphics cards and multiprocessing cores a lot better than KSP1. Because that's the crazy thing, is you can have a beast of a computer and it, and it just totally like, it, it can't hand, it doesn't use all your RAM, doesn't, like it will use like 10% of my processor. It'll use like 10% of my graphics card. It'll use like, a gig of RAM or something. It's so, it, it does not utilize the resource as well. And I really, that's honestly, that's, KSP2 looks gorgeous and it looks like they're gonna have a lot of awesome updates. But I think one of the biggest things is I really, really, really want it to be able to handle, to utilize more resources properly because I think that's um, gonna be a very, very good thing. So, um, yeah. Um, I, all right, guys, well, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and, and sign off here. Again, if you guys want to help me do what I do, I think the most fun way is to get into everydayastronaut.com slash shop and shop around, uh, look for apparel, uh, and check out the rapid unscheduled, dis dis the rapid unscheduled discounts. Um, and again, if you do work in the aerospace industry, you can even take 25% off of this even. Um, that's just my thank you to you. You can click on this link here. You will have to put in a work email that's from an approved URL. Uh, so say at nasa.org or at ula.com or at SpaceX. Um, it just sends you, it just pings you directly um, a link or a, a discount code. That's all it is. It's just a way for me to verify that you do work in the aerospace industry. It's not, um, there's no like list you'll be put on or anything. It's literally just like a pinging system that, that has a pre-approved set of domains. Um, that's my thank you to you because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without all of you working really, really, really hard in the aerospace industry. Um, but yeah, so check that out if you're, if you're in the aerospace industry. Uh, and otherwise, guys, get some of the stuff here before it sells out. I think almost all of the stores, like, we're doing a whole other run of just about everything. So, oh, I'm currently wearing the Apollo Blueprint all over shirt. So if you want one of those, that's where you find it. EverydayAstronaut.com slash shop. All right, guys, um, I think that's going to do it for me because I am going to go, like I said, record my podcast. I'm going to finish scripting, or not finish scripting, maybe, maybe. I'm getting close, actually. I'm getting really close. Found, it took me so long. Uh, you can, <laughs> if you're in our Discord channel, thank you for culling through so many pages of random things to find numbers on, specifically the J2T 250K Aerospike engine. I could not find those numbers anywhere. And it took um, literally, I think, two days of like looking through old archives, um, the NASA archives and a whole bunch of other random archives. Finally found an old scan of a PDF on page like 113 or something that had the specs that I was looking for. It took way too long. So thank you, Discord, for helping me. Uh, everyone is just like scrambling to try to find those numbers. And that stuff is really hard sometimes. If you enjoy that type of thing, uh, please consider becoming a, a Patreon member because it is actually, it's a lot of fun. If, if you have time and you're into uh, some of the stuff you want to learn kind of as I'm learning, that's the best way. Uh, we are be sitting in, we have like a, a sub 
section of the Discord channel called Upcoming Strip Scripts and Research. And I'll be hanging out there uh, just being like, guys, help me find this. And, and lots of times people, uh, you go down some fun rabbit holes. I, I personally actually really enjoy that part. So um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, yeah, Ghostwriter, thank you. Ghostwriter, you definitely uh, were a major player in this one. So thank you. Um, but it is kind of fun, isn't it? Like, I, I kind of enjoy the, the, like, the gratification of like, yes, we finally found it. Especially that, that Aerospike, that last one. It was very hidden away, very, very hidden away. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, again, yes, to cryo storage, to answer your question, yes, I have a podcast. We're on like episode 47 or 48, Our Ludicrous Future. And um, I'm just a co host of it. There's three of us, but it's super fun. Uh, that way we can talk. And I'm kind of the space guy, so I answer all the questions about rockets and we talk about that stuff. So, um, definitely listen to that. But I'm going to be surfing tomorrow, I think. So wish me luck. Um, and then hopefully, I'm hearing rumors that there is a NOTAM uh, already published for next week. So that would be awesome. Uh, and a NOTAM, sorry, is a notice to airmen or NOTAM, uh, notice to airmen. And that is the FAAs would be basically giving Starhopper a chance to hop. And I'm really hoping for Monday so I can go home. <laughs> so. Um, Oh, Evan, uh, super chat wouldn't work for my longer message for some reason. Tweet, just tweet, tweeted you my why don't they just nice, Evan? I I'll see if that gets chosen for our why don't they just this week. Um, all right, that's gonna do it for me, guys. It is time to go get some coffee and get refueled up for the podcast. All right, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, guys.